I work for the Atlantic Salmon Federation. Uh, we're based out of uh, New Brunswick, Canada. I was asked to talk about uh, both our, our acoustic telemetry work that we've been doing and our satellite telemetry work. I'm going to jump right into the acoustic telemetry aspect of it. I wanted to give everybody a bit of perspective in terms of where we are here in Reykjavik compared to where all of our telemetry work is occurring in uh, eastern Canada. Uh, we can zoom in a little bit here. We can see you know, these blue lines representing our primary study rivers where we're acoustically tagging smolt and kelt. For the sake of this talk, I'm only going to be talking about the, uh, the smolt. And the red points and lines showing where we have receiver infrastructure. All of that was set up very nicely for us. We understand what that's doing. Okay, so a <clears throat> bit of a background. We started tagging both the north and the southwest Miramichi River back in 2003. Picked up the rest of Goosh, Cascopedia. By 2007, there's receiver arrays at both of the exits coming out of this large embayment, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, to the east, the Cabot Strait, and then Strait of Belle Isle, or just Sobe, as we like to call it for short, to the north. Um, in 2015, we put a second array just north of the original one, um, and that was done because all the fish that we were detecting leaving the Gulf of St. Lawrence, they were doing so through the Strait of Belle Isle. Okay, so that seemed to be the sort of migratory strategy of all the fish that were being tagged and, and detected. Um, and we put that second array there so that we could estimate the probability of detection and therefore survival. We were really interested in, in learning what this the survival was for these four populations of fish for this roughly 800 kilometer journey as, as the crow flies, okay? Um, now, this figure is basically showing us that. This is the survival for these four populations going back from the beginning of the time series um, from release point through the freshwater section. That's what you see in the purple. Then to the green, that's to essentially the mouths of the rivers at the ends of their estuaries or embayments before it dumps into the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and then in yellow across the, the, uh, the entire Gulf of St. Lawrence to Strait of Belau. So we published a paper on this back in, oh, I think it was 2018 or so. Um, and you know, one of the interesting things that we found was that um, the smolt that made it to the Gulf or made it across the Gulf, the survival for those individuals was, was relatively high. Um, we're looking at about 60% survival, and that was across all the populations and, and through time. So it didn't seem as though, you know, this issue that we often hear about, marine mortality, it doesn't seem to be manifesting itself, and I use manifesting very, very deliberately. Uh, it's not manifesting itself this early on into their migration, this first 800 kilometers. Uh, the other thing that is probably glaringly obvious is um, the survival uh, that we see through the estuaries. You know, as we heard just a moment ago, you know, it's, it can typically be quite high. We found survival through rivers and estuaries to be um, survival high, uh, mortality fairly low, with the exception of trends that we see now in the north, uh, northwest Miramichi River and to some degree the southwest. Now, this can really just be explained by predation. Um, and we can identify predation events with acoustic telemetry data. There's multiple ways we can do this. One way that I think that is going to be crucial, critical to um, the way we, we sort of develop how we identify these types of events is through modeling, taking a number of different modeling approaches to uh, essentially generalizing species behaviors. And so if I was going to show you typical smolt behavior um, through the Miramichi system, this is the type of plot you're going to see. This is the location of the detections of that individual on, in the river. So the further up the axis, the y-axis you are, the further up river you are, you've got the data detection across the x. So you, know, you see this pretty unidirectional movement. I'm sure for a lot of the rivers you people maybe work in, this is probably what you expect there as well, this relatively quick unidirectional movement downstream. Department of Fisheries and Oceans were tagging striped bass. Um, these fish, they're pretty large uh, predatory species that move into the estuary to spawn. Um, around the same time, the smolts are moving out of the river. Um, and the population of these individuals went from about 5,000. They were in real bad shape. They're now about 500,000. So you can imagine what 500,000 predators in a 10-kilometer stretch of river looks like. It's pretty wild. What we noticed is as the abundance of these striped bass increased, we were seeing a lot of tag smolt looking like this. So we developed, uh, we developed models, the, essentially these machine learning algorithms that could generalize smolt behavior 
you generalize striped bass behavior, that you then show that model tag detections from something like this yellow individual, and you ask that model to give you a probability that that individual is moving like a striped bass. And obviously, this type of methodology is expandable to more than just one predatory species. You can incorporate as many as you like. We've looked at things as well. We put out papers on how, how much predation can actually just, if, you, if you're naive to it, how much it can bias your inferences with respect to survival and other metrics that we use to convey different migratory behaviors or dynamics. So getting to what really excites me uh, about this acoustic telemetry data, this is what I just get a little giddy about. It's kind of wrapped up in this figure. Um, so what you find is that the fish that reach the ocean, uh, they do so in a segregated sense uh, when we're talking at the population level. So Miramichi, they're getting into the ocean kind of mid to late May. The Restigouche is more early June. Cascopedia is more mid-June, typically speaking. When they arrive at the Strait of Belle Isle, they are all very well mixed. So the, remember, this is 800 kilometers later in, in the ocean. That, those populations are all really well mixed, and it takes place over about a week or so. If we look at the relationship between the number of days it takes them to do that, that transit across the Gulf in relation to when they enter into the Gulf of St. Lawrence, you see those relationships for each and every year, all these different colored lines. And what you'll notice is that relationship, it's, it's pretty consistent year in, year out. That relationship is almost the same. The intercept's changing, so there's some interannual variation. But then that just got me thinking. I was like, wow, okay, this is... This is really interesting stuff. What does that mean? There's, there's something mediating the timing of these fish across the Gulf. Is there some sort of oceanographic feature that is, is doing that? And then I just fell down a real deep, dark rabbit hole. <laughs> and, and essentially, you know, I was thinking, well, maybe these, these oceanographic features are, are, are also potentially allowing these fish to orient and navigate their way across the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So I thought, okay, how am I, how am I going to address this? I use these... Um, individual base modeling approach. So essentially, I'm just trying to simulate movements of smolt across the Gulf through these 3D ocean circulation models. They're like climate models, but for the ocean. Okay, and so with these simulations, you're, you're going to see an animation here in a second, but I just want to set it up. Particles represent actual individuals with respect to their timing. When they get into and out of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, they make that crossing. Um, and on those particles, we can impose whatever type of hypothetical migratory strategy you think a smolt might employ, right? We could say they're going with the current, against the current, looking for a temperature gradient or some optimal temperature. What optimal temperature? I don't know. We'll pick five or six ranges. We can try it all. We ran thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of simulations. You treat it like a big sensitivity analysis, and you see what kind of rises to the, you know, the, the cream of the crop, so to speak. And you also identify some things that are just not plausible at all. So <clears throat> the behavior that really seemed to win out was this strategy where smolt are dividing their migratory time between moving towards a geographic point of attraction, in this case, the Labrador Sea. And we interpret that as this ability to magnetically orient themselves. So you're doing that or and you're feeding, right? And this is all in light of whether you're in this four to 10 degree temperature band. And that's what those contour lines that are moving along the map are showing you. So if you're in that four to 10 degree water, you're spending more time feeding, less time migrating towards Labrador Sea. If you're not in that four to 10 degree water, the opposite's true. You're having to, to move a little bit quicker, okay? Um, some things were just completely implausible, going with or against current or anything along those lines, just looking for temperature alone. All these things failed catastrophically. And, 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 you know, how we actually do this is, like I said, these particles represent actual individuals. So I can say, okay, does the particle A, does it make it to the Strait of Belle Isle? And if it does, what's the temporal error in relation to the actual fish that we heard? What's that temporal error? And we, that's how we're ranking these, these different simulations, okay? Um, so recap, long-term monitoring, you know, we identified survival issues in the Miramichi River. Um, I wouldn't even just say identified, quantified is probably a better word. Uh, early marine survival uh, seems to be relatively high and stable. Um, and smolt migrating across the Gulf of St. Lawrence, uh, this is something I forgot to mention in the last slide, they are having to boogie. Um, if I told you the numbers that I think these fish are moving at, you'd probably start throwing your drinks at me. 
Uh, I'm, I'm thinking it's probably in the realm of two to two and a half body lengths a second, maybe even faster than that, which seems really fast if you've ever looked at any of the literature regarding laboratory-based trials. Um, and the timing seems to be mediated by sea surface temperature. So this, you know, this, I, I think it's pretty easy to see what the implications of that are. You know, if water temperatures are rising quicker, it means fish have less time to feed and they have to migrate out of the Gulf sooner. They're reaching the Labrador Sea, potentially in a much less fit condition, and there is a fair bit of evidence uh, to suggest that has been the case for Gulf of St. Lawrence fish. A lot of Kevin Friedland's uh, older work would suggest that. All right, switching gears entirely, we're gonna talk satellite tags now. As you can see, these tags are pretty big. We can only tag adult fish with these tags. They aren't connected directly to the fish. They are connected via a harness. And if the fish, after we release it, is presumed to be dead or it reaches a specific calendar day, the tag pops off the fish, floats to the surface, transmits all of the data that it's acquired through the sensors, light, temperature, depth, uh, across an Argos na satellite network and back to us, okay? That's what these tags are, that's what they do. With a little post-processing, this is the type of information you get, okay? This is an individual that was tagged um, in the spring as a kelt, so it's heading back out to the ocean to recondition. Um, the line on the map represents the most likely location. Um, I don't like most likely, typically. I like to see the error around that. I want to see the probability distribution, which is what that yellow to purple shading is, right? Yellow being most likely, purple being not as likely, but possible. Um, and then you've got the depth profile of this fish in the top and the temperature profile in the bottom, okay? Very cool stuff. Uh, yeah, just like the acoustic telemetry, we've got the ability to identify predation events with these satellite tags. These are two individuals. They left the Gulf of St. Lawrence to the Strait of Belle Isle. They turned around and started heading back in. Pretty odd. Temperature profiles change. Depth profiles change. You look at this individual on the right-hand side, I highly doubt that individual ran into a 25-degree pocket of water. Okay, so... To me, this is very good evidence for predation by some type of endothermic predator, something like a mako shark, bluefin tuna. They can keep their core quite a bit warmer than the water around them. Um, bit of a background, uh, between 2012 and 16, we're only tagging spring kelts. Um, 2018, um, we go up with uh, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, US Department, Tim Sheehan, some of you might know him, um, to see if we could capture uh, uh, adult fish at West Greenland, tag them, and follow their movements in the winter and uh, the following spring, hopefully back to their, their natal river. We could do it. We caught 12 fish, went back in 2019, caught 20 fish and tagged them and released them. Uh, we had more tags than fish. We were not very good at catching fish on a rod and a reel and off the coast of West Greenland. We got some help, talked to some people who knew what they were doing. As everybody knows, 2020 was a bit of a bust. 2021, um, we, I think we really had it dialed in in terms of how to target these fish off the coast of, of Greenland. Um, and we also uh, sort of joined forces. There was about 45, 50 organizations that were all taking advantage of this Environmental Studies Research Fund, a $12 million pot of money that was being kind of fueled by oil and gas exploration is essentially where that came from. So we had a lot more money for more tags. Um, 78 spring kelp and 70 uh, at West Greenland, and then 2022, less spring kelp being tagged um, and more fish at West Greenland. So this is the last slide. This is just an animation showing the movement of all the 2021 fish that were tagged and released. Now, not all these fish are destined to be heading towards West Greenland. A lot of these are what we would call consecutive spawners, meaning they're just going to go out, recondition for a month or two, and pop back into the river. Um, some of these fish are obviously destined to be alternate spawners. All the points are showing up as black, um, suggesting that the region of origin, if you're looking at the legend, is unknown. We caught them in the rivers where they spawned. We do know their re region of origin. Um, these colored points are more to reflect the West Greenland fish that you now see leaving where we tagged and released all these fish in West Greenland. Um, the only European fish that we have identified genetically here are what would be considered UK Irish fish. Um, and I was talking with somebody, I don't know where she is earlier. Yeah, there you are. We were talking about whether that is that there were no other European fish or whether that's a result of that's all we have 
to compare to um, in terms of the genetic analysis. Like we might not have the ability to identify Norwegian or some other stock. Okay. Um, yeah, and so you can see, you know, by March, yeah, there's not a whole lot of fish left to follow, but you know, I look at this blue guy that just came right up by Iceland in March and April, and that fish is destined to be coming back to the Gaspé Peninsula here inside the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and they usually hit the ocean kind of late June, early July. It's fantastic that that fish was off the coast of Iceland and whatever it was, you know, late April, basically right about now. It's incredible. Anyway, that's all I have. So thank you very much.